Hi, this is Lily DeHoyce Anderson, and you're listening to Choosing Glory. As ever, thanks for joining me this week. We're talking about Alma, chapters 36 to 38, how quickly a year is going in the Book of Mormon. Some areas are dragging, but some areas are flying by. In fact, and just remembering this now, I was listening to a news interview and Glenn Beck was the guest. As many of you know, he's a member of the church, a recovered alcoholic, a very conservative voice. I don't follow him. I don't listen to his stuff typically, but he was a guest on another show. And anyway, the interviewer asked him, he said, well, what do you think of the last two weeks of just all the things that have happened in the news? And as you're aware, a lot of things have been going on in the news Worldwide, certainly in the United States, and anyway, so Glenn Beck paused for a moment and and then looked up at the interviewer and he said, all I can say is, Jesus is coming. So (laughs) I was like, well, you know, we're not the only ones feeling it. And it's not just members of our church. A little bit more on that later, but we're in a bizarre world. Things are just as prophesied. Good is called evil, evil is called good. I'm frankly exhausted by how many times I come up against the idea that out of the church, in the church, sometimes we can look at exactly the same situation and completely disagree on what we're seeing. One person sees black, one person sees white. That is, that's bizarre world. It's a strange time. And as we have mentioned before, this prophecy by Heber C. Kimball that I knew from the time I was very young that the day would come when no man can stand on borrowed light. And I understood it then to be an important reminder and a good thing to keep in mind, but it has taken on a whole new dimension of meaning to me as I have thought we have to have the Holy Ghost in our lives to even be able to determine what is real what is true. And I think that's great. This is why our prophet is telling us that we should hear him and that we, all the prophets have said that. This is nothing new. And as we've talked about, all the prophets have invited us, Christ himself prophesied or encouraged us all through the Doctrine and Covenants and other scriptures to be born of the Spirit, to sanctify ourselves. And as we are on this path to sanctification, which comes from that boringly consistent obedience that may we all be striving for. And finally, we are found worthy for the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. We will know truth from error all the time. And we can certainly tap into that before we have completed the process of sanctification. The Lord is kind and generous. And if we ask, we receive. So we can, we can seek truth. I'm concerned (laughs) that There are so many voices out there that I think many are well-intentioned voices. I think some are, I mean, we're all over the place these days, and I'm concerned about maybe the casual way we approach some truth. I shouldn't say casual. I don't really mean casual, but the varied ways that we approach truth and how different our conclusions can be. (laughs) So, okay, We'll, we'll get to some more current events here in a minute, but first I just want to respond to a couple of people who let me know that they were a little bothered by something that Harper said in my discussion with him a couple of weeks ago that my son visited with me on the podcast about Antichrist. Maybe some of you saw that. And he mentioned that lying yourself can be the root of mental illness or something along those lines. And Brothers and sisters, this was not intended to be a one-size-fits-all statement. Not all mental illness is the same. It's a very, very broad subject and experience. So please take it in the way that you need to. Like, honestly, if you're interested, you can Google self-deception or lying to oneself and mental illness. And a lot of articles come up. So this is a topic that others have discussed and discovered. I'm just going to say a couple of things about this. Some of these are more obvious than others, right? 
Some research has found that self-deception has a prominent role in several medical conditions such as borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and histrionic personality disorder. I think we can, many of us see that, or maybe we've experienced a little of that with people that we've had in our lives. You know, other authors or researchers talk about how you know, we sometimes do have a distorted view, not necessarily, you know, with the intention of trying to hurt somebody or anything like that, but just that we don't always look at things in a completely clear way and it can shape our reality. I mean, we talk about things like denial, right? Again, is that intentional? Not always. Sometimes it might be, but it's not always. So this is, as I said, not a one size fits all situation, but Also, another time that people sometimes write about self-deception mental illness is initially as a kind of protection, that the truth is too painful. So this sadly can lead to other problems. This is why God says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I mean, it doesn't mean that it's going to solve immediately all levels of mental illness. It doesn't mean that we're evil if we struggle with, with mental illness. This is not about judging or condemning people. There's real suffering out there and a lot of different reasons and permutations of any kind of mental illness. So it's not intended to blame the victim. This was just a thought that Harper had about how some kinds of mental illness, as mentioned here in other forms of that in terms of denial or maybe trying to protect ourselves from some things so that we end up not clear on the situation that we're in or have a clear view of the people that we're dealing with. I mean, as a counselor, there are many times where that has been a part of our work together in working with a client that, you know, let's try to understand things as they really are, not claiming that we know all things in an instant, but that the more clear we can be in our understanding, the more honest we can be, again, not like an intentional deception necessarily, although that can happen too, but but more in the way of just sometimes getting locked into a certain kind of thinking. I mean, self-denigration is a kind of self-deception. If we're constantly telling ourselves we're not good enough or smart enough, pretty enough, not worth it, you know, not lovable, those those are kinds of things that can lead to problems as well. So anyway, that's the idea. It was not intended to offend anybody. So sorry about that. Sometimes I'm not too worried about offending people. As you may have noticed, it's not that I intentionally want to hurt people. I don't. I do try to be kind, but not in this instance, of course, have any intention to suggest that it's your fault if you're struggling with mental illness. That's not what the conclusion was intended to sound like. I'm going to go backwards with these chapters today, just because I think Alma 36 has a lot of the punchlines. This section as well as next week's section are the chapters of Alma talking to his sons prior to the end of his ministry. We're going to save Corianton for next week. That's his younger son, but he has the three sons, Helaman, who becomes the next prophet leader, Chiblon, the middle son, and Corianton that we'll talk about next week. So let's talk about chapter 38, which is Alma's words to his son, Shiblon, the middle son. And this is relatively short. Shiblon's obviously a good son and obedient, so he doesn't have a lot more to share. He does talk a little bit about his experience with the angel. Let me just talk about verse 1 for a moment of chapter 38. You know, even as I said unto Helaman, inasmuch as you shall keep the commandments of God, you shall prosper in the land. And inasmuch as you will not keep the commandments of God, you shall be cut off from his presence. You may have noticed, I hope you did, how often that is repeated in his counsel to his sons. So this message of this being a promised land and that people will be blessed if they obey the commandments and worship the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ. Very consistent theme throughout the Book of Mormon. Let's not shy away from it. God prospers his people in his way and in his time. And again, sometimes we we want to put things in tidy little boxes and it doesn't work because... You know, otherwise, why wasn't Joseph Smith really wealthy? Well, that wasn't the intent of his journey and his ministry. So we can't just say that every time somebody is rich or prosperous, that means that they're righteous. And every time they're not, that means they're doing something wrong. Clearly not. It does mean that we are ultimately going to be 
blessed if we worship the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ. And again, we've tried to point out how this is a repeated theme, even in the trials of life. So it, it's not one or the other. It's the blessing in the affliction. It's the deliverance from time to time in the Lord's time, not ours. And after trouble, I mean, we talked about these brothers of the four sons of Mosiah who go off and we just get a little taste of the fact that they were imprisoned and they were in bonds and they suffered different kinds of tribulation. And the same thing is said of Shiblon here. Verse four, I also know that thou wast stoned for the word's sake. So he goes on this mission with Alma, with that dream team we talked about, right, to the Zormites, and he was stoned at some point. And thou didst bear all these things with patience because the Lord was with thee. And now, you know, inasmuch as you put your trust, this is verse 5, in God even so much you shall be delivered out of your trials and your troubles and your afflictions and lifted up at the last day. So let's not complain until we get to the last day, okay? <laughs> does that mean patience in trials? Yeah, it does. It means enduring to the end. It means not being hasty about our feelings of requiring justice or longing for justice or even longing for the coming of the Lord. I'd like him to come now. I really would. And many of you feel the same way. What's wrong with today? What's wrong with coming tomorrow? Wouldn't it give us incredible joy and relief to see the end of injustice, the end of sin on this planet? Just think of what a great relief it will be to Mother Earth that has to support all of us, righteous and wicked and everywhere in between, and how difficult that must be. I've thought about that a lot lately, about how the earth groaned when Christ was killed. And of course, that was a, a pinnacle of, of pain for the earth because her very creator had died. But she is suffering now as well. She has a spirit and she must be suffering now as so much wickedness abounds on the planet. So wouldn't it be wonderful for the Lord to come? But it will be in his time, not in my time, in his time and so we adjust our expectations and try to be patient and try to wait upon the Lord while improving the moments that we are given, trying to learn, trying to grow, trying to become. Okay, he does mention he had suffered, and Alma testifies to Shiblon of Jesus Christ, again, which is the recurrent message of this book. It is another testament to Jesus Christ, and that there is no other way or means, that's verse 9, no other way or means whereby man can be saved only in and through Christ. He is the life and the light of the world. He is the word of truth and righteousness. That is the king that we worship. That is, that is the God that we worship. We worship God the Father and we worship his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who is the steward over this mortal time, the creator of the heavens and the earth and he is the only way. So all of these things hopefully are bringing us closer to Christ. One of my daughters mentioned, wouldn't it be nice if at FSY they they just, you know, kind of echoed the words of the for the strength of youth pamphlet and or summarize them to say like wear clothes that you would feel comfortable wearing in the presence of the savior. And yes, everybody gets to choose. Everybody gets to grow in their time and so on. But maybe it would be a good reminder to say that, like, he is coming. And how do we want to be living when he appears? Do we want to be like him? Do we want to be recognizable to him as his people? It's not just about the youth. It's about every one of us. What will we be found doing when the Lord comes? What will our choices be? What will our devotions be? What will our efforts to improve and become a better version of ourselves be? We don't have to be finished, brothers and sisters. I say this all the time. We just we need to make the choice to be on that covenant path and continue in diligence. Okay, there is a nice statement here too in this chapter to Shiblon, verse 12, when he talks about testifying of Christ, use boldness, but not overbearance. 
And also see that here's the part that I really like. Bridle all your passions that ye may be filled with love. Bridle all your passions. I think there's a real reference here to what I talk about in my book, Choosing Glory. Or, you know, the ideas that God teaches this that I talk about in that book about the three realms. Bridling our passions takes us out of the telestial into the terrestrial. That's, that's what separates, basically, the law of the telestial from the law of the terrestrial, the middle kingdom. And that is bridling our passions. It's harnessing our natural man so that our appetites and passions are not in charge of our behavior. Now, I did want to mention this, that, I mean, look look how he then says that then you may be filled with love. Well, the love of Christ or charity is actually more at a celestial level. And we can certainly work on that at the terrestrial level, but it's an endowment to love somebody in exactly the same way that God loves us and loves all his children with a perfect, pure love. That's charity. That's an endowment. And it cannot come to us when we are still wrestling with the natural man all the time and losing sometimes. We do need to be boringly consistent. We need to bridle the passions so that God can take us to that higher level through the gifts of the Spirit, through sanctification, through the endowment of charity, through giving us a new heart, changing us, again, and putting his image in our countenances, that mighty change, that new creature that is born, that lifts us to a celestial level. It's a gift that comes because we ask and because we have demonstrated our desire for it with consistent behavior. And we put ourselves in the path of receiving that. Now, that's, that's a different level. So I think as we're going to see here, and especially as we're going to see next week when Balma talks to Corianton, there is a lot of discussion about the consequences of sin, about the, the pain and the anguish of unrepented sin, the suffering that happens for unrepented sin. And I, I think we're in a world that wants to sort of sanitize that in a way. Like, can we, they just want to like sort of strip quote some parts of the scripture and leave out the parts that sound difficult or painful or that recognize or acknowledge or teach the responsibility that we have to repent or suffer. Anyway, we're going to see that as we talk about these chapters, but I think that it's really important to see that it's bridling our passions. It's just the beginning of it. Sometimes we think if I do that, if I harness the natural man, I'm celestial. No, <laughs> no, that just gets us out of the celestial, which is a great thing, brothers and sisters. And as we have mentioned, that we only need to be living terrestrial law to be protected in the cleansing of the earth. When Christ comes and cleanses the earth by fire, the terrestrial will not be destroyed. So again, you know, bridle your passions and help our children to bridle their passions with appropriate parenting. Check out those videos on Patreon because there are tools that can help us to successfully and with confidence, motivate our children to harness their natural man. That is a huge gift that we can give our children in their youth so that then they have the option, if they choose it, to go further. But at least they can survive the second coming and then they'll have more time to keep working on it, right? Okay, I'm getting lost here, but I guess I wanted to say this and I almost forgot this, but it's work to bridle our passions, right? I mean... <laughs> I mean, just to be able to do what you want when you want to do it is, I suppose, you know, less effortful place to be. Like, I can just go with my impulses. I can just feed my appetites and satisfy those desires as they come at the cost of whomever is around or, you know, ultimately myself. So I've had people mention to me and sometimes with a query why is it that, you know, I have friends or family members who have left the church who say they've never been happier? Like now that they're not having to believe all the things that they did before or wear their garments anymore, or now they can drink or smoke or whatever, and they can do what they want on the Sabbath day, that they feel happier than they have ever felt. And I'm like, well, it's a natural man happiness. It's an appetite, desires, passions happiness. And yes, Pleasure comes when the natural man is satisfied. So 
Of course, they are saying, you know, I, I feel happy, but it's a momentary or I should say a temporary pleasure. It's not ultimate joy and happiness that comes from God when we magnify our potential, when we fulfill the measure of our creation and become what we have the potential to become. The joy in the celestial is going to be like a no contest comparison to the happiness that will be found in other kingdoms. I think God is so generous and kind that, yes, even people in the celestial, ultimately, after they have to pay the price of their unrepented sins in hell, will ultimately be redeemed from there into the celestial kingdom, and they will be happy. But that happiness will be very small comparison to the joy of the terrestrial and the ultimate and perfect, complete joy that will be in the celestial. So understand what people mean when they say that. They go, oh, I've never been happier. Well, yeah, because I'm no longer having to break a sweat to control myself. And I suppose there's a relief in there that is temporarily pleasurable. But ultimately, it's bondage. Sin is bondage. God isn't making up rules just to make us jump through hoops. He actually knows where true happiness, joy, and fulfillment lie. And he gives us advanced information about that which is one of the great blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, chapter 37. It's the transfer of the stewardship of the records to Helaman. And then Alma mentions in verses 6 and 7 that by small and simple means are things brought to pass. So, you know, he says we don't know exactly what these are for, but then he mentions that the records have been a great blessing for missionary work and have converted people to many of the Lamanites and some of the Nephites who have come to repentance that the scriptures have been a great tool for that. And then, of course, he says, and for future generations. So look at us in the last days where the coming forth of the Book of Mormon was one of the great signs of the second coming of Christ because it was a great tool of the restoration. And look at how many people just reading the pages of the Book of Mormon have come to understand their Savior at a higher level and have come to know that this is his designated kingdom on earth and that the power of the priesthood is here that can help us make covenants with our heavenly father that can bring us closer to living that celestial law if we pursue this path diligently so anyway an incredible incredible blessing that the book of mormon has been and can be in our lives if we allow it i remember ezra taft benson many years ago some of you are too young to have heard this personally but Maybe you have heard of his speech that said that the church was under condemnation for that period for underutilizing the Book of Mormon. Let's not ever be guilty of that again. Now, let's talk about Alma 36, which is, you know, such a powerful chapter. We have already heard this basic sketch of Alma's repentance with the sons of Mosiah, but he gives us more detail here as he talks to his son Helaman. And I think it's worth treasuring this as he gives us some great insight. Again, he talks about the blessings of those who worship the God of the land, Jesus Christ, and they'll prosper in the land. And then, of course, you know, in my grief and in my transition time of losing my husband, these words about suffering always kind of stand out to me. At the end of verse 2, this is chapter 36, verse 2, that he talks about how their ancestors and forefathers could not be delivered except it was from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he surely did deliver them in their afflictions. And I'm looking for that. I believe that it will come, that there will be deliverance from the pain, deliverance from the grief. And not that I'll ever stop missing Chris until a time of reunification, but that there will be blessings to come. And I trust in that. It keeps me going (laughs) sometimes. I mean, there are those of you to whom I complain, so you know that it's not been an easy journey. It's not. It's not. And I want it to accomplish in me what the Lord desires, because I believe that he has answers for those. I believe he has blessings for the afflictions that we suffer, and he will deliver us from them. Again, in verse 3, I do know that whosoever shall put their trust in God shall be supported in their trials and their troubles and their afflictions and shall be lifted up for the last day. Again, the big blessings come at the last day. It's hard to be patient, but that's clearly a part of faith. And it's a test of faith 
to be patient and to trust in his timing and to trust that in the meantime, there's a refining process that's going on that helps us to turn from lead into gold, from mortal to the potential to be like our father eventually, like our savior and like our father. So yeah, it's about trusting it. And then he talks about had he not been born of God, he would not have known these things. Now then he, he's going to tell us how that happens. And born of God, of course, if you look those things up, it does make it clear that that is the same idea as sanctification. In fact, I think this was in, on the website, the church website, in the Church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints, being born of God is a spiritual rebirth that occurs when someone receives the Holy Ghost. Again, not confirmation, but the reception of the Holy Ghost is a constant companion that purifies us from the effects of the fall. And experience the remission of sins. This can happen when someone takes on God's name, that would be baptism, obeys his commandments that comes after and listens to the Holy Ghost. So we grow line on line, precept on precept to that place where we are qualified for the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. So anyway, that's what Alma's talking about. And we have been talking about how important it is to get there. In fact, I really have felt that, well, I've thought about this. I know that sanctification would be healing from these mortal losses. It doesn't mean that it would be a complete restoration until again, the day of reunification with our loved ones, but that it would be, it, it would change how I experience it. And I, I long for that completion. I hope that I'm on that path. I hope I've been on that path for a long time and I long for that completion. And if that's part of what I'm going through, then, and that would be worth it. And I know that God will make it worthwhile if I continue in faith which, you know, it's harder some days than others. But that is the only answer that makes sense. Now let's look at some of his specific words. I think this is really wonderful detail, as I said. Verse 7, we're in chapter 36 of Alma. Well, in 6, he talks about how he went around with the sons of Mosiah, seeking to destroy the church of God, and God sends his holy angel. Verse 7, he spake unto us as it were the voice of thunder. Now, I want you to hold that thought for a minute. <laughs> the angel speaks in the voice of thunder, and the whole earth did tremble beneath our feet. This is a big deal. It was, you know, a, an experience with lots of sensation, with lots of physical manifestation of power. The voice is like a voice of thunder, and the earth trembles beneath our feet, and we all fell to the earth, for the fear of the Lord came upon us. And the voice says, Arise, and I stood up, and here the angel says in verse 9, If thou wilt of thyself be destroyed, seek no more to destroy the church of God. Now, I love that language, and I remember thinking about this over the years. If thou wilt of thyself be destroyed. Like, we get to choose that. Like, God has given us the gift of agency. And what that does mean, I mean I've put it this way before, but that means you can go to hell if you want to. Like, God will not stop us. He will invite us. He will feel after us. He will... You know, if we are covenant people, especially, but for all his children, he loves them, gives as many opportunities, make sure everyone will have a full opportunity, but we can choose to reject him. We, we can do that. God never forces. That was Satan's plan. We will decide our eternal destiny. It's on us. We can't blame anybody else but ourselves. We can't say the devil made me do it, or it was because of my mother or my father or my whomever, that I got messed up and it's not my fault. Like ultimately, and of course, God will take into consideration situations that impinge on our agency. But overall, most of us can exercise that agency in this life. And we hear it right here. If thou wilt of thyself be destroyed, I mean, you can make that choice. But seek no more to destroy the church of God. Other people need to have their choice too, and you're slanting it and you're helping to destroy your brothers and sisters by going out there and preaching all this false doctrine or antichrist stuff or whatever. Anyway, and then, okay, he falls to the space, to the earth, and it's for the space of three days and three nights, he couldn't open his mouth or use his limbs. Now, look at this, verse 11. The angel spake more things unto me. Okay, the angel wasn't done. <laughs> look at this detail. Which were heard by my brethren. But I did not hear them. Now, 
Let's back up. This is an angel who speaks with a voice of thunder, and the earth trembles, and Alma doesn't hear it. <laughs> I mean, once he hears that first message, whew, he's checked out. His brethren hear a further message. Alma does not. He doesn't hear it, even though it has that kind of sensory intensity. But look why he explains that, or he explains why. When I heard the words, if thou wilt be destroyed of thyself, seek no more to destroy the church of God, I was struck with such great fear and amazement, lest perhaps I should be destroyed. <laughs> okay. Apologize for the chuckles, but it does kind of make me chuckle. Because Alma had been taught the gospel. He had a father who was a prophet. We don't know how much Alma the Younger, you know, had experienced his father in Alma the Elder's wayward years as a priest of Noah or whatever. But, I mean, we, there's a lot of information that we don't have in its entirety here. Nevertheless, we, we know that Alma had been taught. And he and the sons of Mosiah were rebelling against the teachings of their fathers and the lives that their fathers were living by example. So, so here's Alma, who has clearly heard that, you know, repent or be destroyed. You know, the wages of sin is death. You know those things in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, sin brings suffering. And he is struck with great fear and amazement, lest he should actually be destroyed. So somehow all those warnings <laughs> had gone right over his head. They hadn't ever landed in a place where he believed that there would be consequences for his sins. I mean, this is such an important message. And our world is doing its best to dilute that message. There is wonderful grace and mercy in the plan of salvation. We're going to talk about that next week. Alma 42, there's some great stuff said about that for next week. But right now, let's just land on this thought for a minute that people hear about it and they don't believe it. And why? I mean, it's watered down right and left. Oh, you know, all dogs go to heaven. You know, everybody, you know, odds are you're going to, you're going to end up in the celestial kingdom. Don't worry about it. The grace of Christ will pull you in. Just, just, you know, keep, you know, now I, there's a balance here. <laughs> Trying to strike the balance. We don't need to be terrified that we won't qualify because if we care, God is thrilled. He loves those who will have him to be their God. If we are seeking the Lord, we will find him and the Lord will help lead us along. So it's not about being terrified or feeling some of those self denigration ideas I talked about before that are kind of self-deception. I'm not good enough. I'm not worth it. I'll never be saved or I can never be a celestial. That's not true. Every one of us has the potential. Every one of us has exactly the same potential to be gods. It's our choice. But let's not water down the fact that we choose and we're responsible for those choices that we make behaviorally for what we choose to believe, for what we choose to do with, with whatever we believe and, and how we live our lives. Because, yes, there is a day of accountability. And here's Alma, struck with great fear and amazement, lest perhaps I should be destroyed, like it's news, you know? And I guess it was. He had heard it before. He had not believed it. And now it's delivered with such force. He's like, oh, my goodness, I am destroying myself. So even though the angel is still speaking with a voice of thunder, he doesn't hear it. And he becomes racked with eternal torment. His soul is harrowed up to the greatest degree, racked with all the sins. I did remember, this is verse 13, all my sins and iniquities for which I was tormented with the pains of hell. Do you think it's just Alma? He's getting a preview. He's getting a preview of what awaits us in hell if we don't repent of our sins in this life. Now, again, God takes into consideration how much we know. But where much is given, much is required. And he who sins against the greatest light has the greatest condemnation, right? So that's not a bad thing to have light. It's just that, like, hey, shape up. We have a lot of information. Let's not act like we don't. Let's, 
recognize that this is a path of mercy, that if we live the commandments that God can be with us and our earthly experiences will help to prepare us for exaltation if that's what we choose. That's a great path. We're going to suffer one way or the other. Life is, uh, as Jordan Peterson says, a fatal disease. <laughs> everyone, everyone dies. Everything turns to dust. All of us encounter failures. The things that we build can crumble. And yet, God will bring us home in glory if we choose him and then allow all those catastrophes of mortal life to refine us and to prepare us and to polish us so that we can be conformed to the image of God's son. So anyway, I think this is beautiful. And I think, you know, he talks about the very thought of coming in the presence of God did rack his soul with an inexpressible horror. That's the end of verse 14. He doesn't want to have to stand before God, if only he could avoid that. And he's racked with the pains of a damn soul. Now, maybe you remember a few weeks ago, it's been a few weeks now, I talked about some near-death experiences and some one of you podcast listeners, bless you, had sent me a video link to a, an interview about someone who had had a negative near-death experience. And anyway, I did some more investigation about that. I was really grateful for that little link because it led me to some other interesting things as well that talked about how we hear a lot about the, you know, walk toward the light, feel the love of God, near-death experiences, but sometimes the others are not as openly shared because people are kind of embarrassed that that was their experience. And it does seem to be a bit of a reflection on the lives that they're living, right? And I mentioned one story about a professor who'd been traveling in Europe with some students and he felt tormented when he had a near-death experience. And he realized that those spirits that were tormenting him were like him. And he acknowledged in this interview that, I mean, I didn't hear from him. I heard from someone who had spoken with him more than a few times to get his story. And the professor who was suffering during that near-death experience mentioned that, you know, he was not faithful to his wife and he had been mean to people and so on. So what was a nice kind of connection here, though, is just what Alma says. He remembered having heard his father prophesy to the people concerning the coming of one Jesus Christ, a son of God, to atone for the sins of the world. Now, as my mind caught hold upon this thought, I cried with my heart, O oh, Jesus, thou son of God, have mercy on me, who am in the gall of bitterness and am circled about by the everlasting chains of death. And behold, when I thought this, this is verse 19, I could remember my pains no more. Skipping a little bit, verse 20, what a joy and what marvelous light I did behold. My soul was filled with joy as exceeding as was my pain. 21, I say unto my son, there could be nothing so exquisite and so bitter as were my pains. Again, I say unto you, my son, that on the other hand, there can be nothing so exquisite and sweet as was my joy. Beautiful language. We're going to stop there, though. But what that professor added in his story to the interviewer was that in his suffering during his near-death experience, being buffeted and tormented by these evil spirits, he had the thought that he should pray. But he was not a religious man. He wasn't a believer. And he said, I don't know how to pray. So he tried to, to sing. <laughs> it's an interesting story. I did tell it before. Sorry for the repeat that he reached for songs like God Bless America and My Country Tis of Thee, which were kind of you know, acknowledging the existence of God. And that was like what he knew. So he tried to reach for that and sing some of the words or recall some of the words. But then he remembered being taken to church as a young child. And he didn't know all the words of this song, but he remembered the first line of a song that they had sung with the children, Jesus Loves Me. And that is when he started to feel delivered from the torment. And 
I mean, I, I think it's interesting because we have heard for many years that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. And I don't know what it is exactly that balances the scales of justice. I mean, sin does bring suffering, so I'm not suggesting that there's like a free pass or if you don't repent that you don't have to suffer as much if you quickly remember Jesus, but I think it's connected. I think it's... I think that... Again, being compelled to be humble is not the best way but it is a way. And those who completely reject God or reject Christ in this life, who could have chosen him, who had information that they could have chosen to believe at whatever level of light they were exposed to. We all have the light of Christ just for coming to this world. We have the light of Christ in us. And if we don't willfully extinguish it, you know, that light can grow as we live in harmony with it. But I guess, again, rambling a little bit here, that if we, if we don't acknowledge him here, we will acknowledge him there. As Neil Maxwell has so eloquently put it, it will not mean as much to kneel when it is no longer possible to stand, but it still will be required because every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. And if it's just in the misery of hell that people will cry out for Jesus, then they will acknowledge him. But it's better not to be compelled to be humble, brothers and sisters. It's better to choose to humble ourselves, to recognize he is the only way. He is the light and the life. He is our redeemer. He can save us from the torments of hell. He can't save us from all the suffering of this life because it is in the trenches of life, in the difficulties of life, that we can be refined if we choose. Now, we can also just be chewed up and spit out, and we can become bitter and angry. <laughs> I keep saying it. Bitterness is right there in the wings all the time when we're suffering. We could choose to let it enter in and take center stage, but we don't have to. We can reject it and say, no, I'm not going to be bitter. I'm going to humble myself, and I'm going to submit to this process, which is clearly a necessary portion for those who desire to be refined and made into gods through the mercy and grace of Christ's atoning sacrifice and through choosing it and obeying and repenting. Anyway, he talks about how incredible that experience was. I love these details. I think they make a big difference in helping us to again, sort of recognize the sophistry of this world where people are watering down the effects of sin and making it seem like it doesn't matter that much how you live. God loves you no matter what. Does God love us no matter what? Yes, he does. But can he lift us to exaltation in the celestial kingdom? Not unless we choose it. Not unless we submit to the process, humble ourselves, acknowledge our own nothingness and come to Christ and kneel before it is no longer possible to stand, but be willing to be subject to his ways and his plan for each one of us, recognizing that there is mercy in every plan for those of us who choose him. We can all come to Christ. There's no limit. You realize that people take themselves out, but God doesn't doesn't deny anybody. Everyone could be in the celestial kingdom, definitely, if everyone would choose that path. So it's not God that is imposing the limit. It's his children who self-select into whichever realm, the laws of which they choose to obey. So if we choose celestial law, the reign of the natural man, that's what we get. If we choose terrestrial law where we harness the natural man, but we settle for that, then that's what we get. It's a lot better than celestial. If we want it all, we can have it all. God does not deny anybody anything. There is no scarcity in the kingdom of God. All of us could be in the kingdom of God if all of us choose it. <laughs> it's not God that's sifting us out. We sift ourselves out if we are so foolish. And we can sift ourselves in. <laughs> we can choose him and his ways, and he will be with us in our afflictions here 
and he will make it all right in the last day. He will restore all things in their completion and in their beauty and in their abundance to overflowing, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That's a reference from Luke 6 about how God measures things. We cannot ever put the Lord in our debt. I do want to just bear a personal witness that, well, one of my friends, Cammie, told me of hearing a woman giving her testimony in their ward a while back, was talking about going through a very difficult loss in her life, and she said something like this. She said, the pain was so loud, I couldn't hear the comfort. And my friend Cammy said, that's what you've been telling me, isn't it? It was more poetically put than I have put it. But yeah, that's how it feels sometimes, that the pain is so loud, it's difficult to hear the comfort or to hear or be able to absorb the love of God. It doesn't mean I don't know it's there. I do know it's there. And what I also want to bear witness of is that Although it's not what I want, <laughs> like, okay, let me amend that. It's not what my immediate desire, you know, a bit of my human nature would desire. I want Chris back, and that's not going to happen. And that's okay, because I know there is a plan, and I know that God's ways are higher than my ways, and he knows more and is in charge if I let him be, and I am willing to do that. So it doesn't assuage that loss right now, but I can see that the Lord has protected me from some difficulties. Now, honestly, there have been a lot of stumbling blocks, <laughs> and, and sometimes I'm just exhausted by them. I'm just like, I can't believe this is so hard, and it's things that should be relatively simple to resolve become very complicated and lengthy and tiring and, and demanding, and I'm just like, seriously? Like, couldn't we just like pave the way a little bit while I'm in this difficult time anyway? But no, it seems that not always. But I still see these like kind of large-scale protections where I will come to be aware that like, wow, that could have gone really badly in a long-term impacting way and it it didn't happen, and not because I knew what to do, but because, you know, something came together or, you know, the way it was done initially that might have been a problem turned out to, to actually make things a little simpler now. I don't want to get into the details, but I've seen that, and I've been aware of that, and I try to make sure I praise God and give thanks for those protections. It doesn't heal my feelings right now. I still can't hear the comfort as much as I hope to as time goes on, as much as I believe I will as time goes on. But I see that God is with me in some really important ways, and I, I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to wait until I can hear the abundance of the love and the comfort and the blessings in all areas. Well, I am seeing the blessings, but... I want to feel all that energy shift, and I, I believe it will. I believe it will, and I believe that there's a purpose for going through this portion of the wilderness that will be consecrated for my gain and for my eternal process and progress. I choose to trust that. I believe it even though I can't see it right now. But I see it in the records, these holy records. I see it in the scriptures. I see it in the history of how God works with his people. And I trust it for myself as well. Okay, a couple of other things I wanted to say. Verse 13 is still to Helaman, Alma speaking to his son Helaman. How strict are the commandments of God? Let's not water it down, brothers and sisters. It's not for sissies. If you keep my commandments, again, you'll prosper in the land. And then what does he say here? Oh, this is where he talks about it's not just a blessing for a missionary work tool now that these records have existed, but also for future generations. That's in verse 14 and a few other verses it's mentioned as well. He does warn against the secret murders and abominations that are talked about in the 24 plates that 
the people of Limhi found that were a record of the Jaredites, remember? So when Limhi is sending out scouts to try to find Zarahemla so that they can get help to be freed from the bondage to the Lamanites, one of those scouting parties finds a land full of bones, and it's the remnant of the Jaredites. And he sees a record there that was buried or put in a cave or whatever by ether. So he takes those plates back to Limhi, and Limhi can't interpret them. But when that scouting party from Zarahemla, led by another man named Ammon, not Ammon, the son of Mosiah, but another one who comes and helps them to escape from bondage, he says, I know someone who can interpret those plates. And he's talking about King Mosiah II. King Mosiah I, we hear from just a little detail in the book of Omni that he had the interpreters. And anyway, I heard church historian Don Bradley, who has a really interesting story, how kind of his study and research in church history first led him out of the church and then led him back in because he continued to be a professional researcher and he had focused on research about the church anyway, but he mentions that it could be that the full story of that would have been in the 116 lost manuscript pages. So there's just kind of a gap in our knowing how did the Nephites get the interpreters, but they did. <laughs> and and those interpreters told them about the destruction of the Jaredite nation, which was because of secret combinations. And Alma warns his son Helaman, about those. It's interesting as he says, tell the people about this so that they'll be warned not to fall into these secret oaths and covenants, but don't tell them what the secret oaths were. So, you know, give them the cautionary tale, but don't give them every detail. And again, this would make good sense, right? Like, why do we study anti-Mormon literature? Why do we listen to anti-Mormon voices or anti-Christ voices? Why do we give that much space in our heads and minds to dwell on things. I'm not saying we should be ignorant about the arguments that people lodge against the church or the prophet or the restoration. I mean, it's good to be critical thinkers about that, not bury our heads in the sand. But there is a needful wisdom in what we allow to consume us and how much time we spend on things that are not strengthening our faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ, in the plan of our Heavenly Father, and in our covenant path, in our prophets, in the leadership of the church, it's not good. We we don't believe in infallibility. On the other hand, we believe that this is God's kingdom on earth, and he is involved, that he is at the head of this church. And we need to be careful about what we take in. So anyway, I'm going to skip over some of this good stuff that I hope you enjoyed and studied. And then... Also, as we have spoken of, and we'll speak of more as we get further on into the time where the secret combinations flourish in Book of Mormon time, we'll talk about this more. But I do want to just say I think we're seeing it on every side. And I think that the day is coming when we, like this people, will be fully ripe. The, you know, the wickedness will be fully ripe. There will be, however, a Zion people that comes out of this dispensation. May it include me. May it include you. I love that in verse 32, he says to teach the people an everlasting hatred against sin and iniquity. That's the very end of verse 32. We should hate sin. We should not hate sinners. We need to love everyone and invite everyone, but we need to hate sin. And it is not that impossible to divide that, but that gets really mushy for a lot of people who think that tolerance means that we have to not hate sin. And that's not true. That's not true. There is a measure of tolerance that's important, but as we quoted a couple of weeks ago, President Monson warned that vice can wear the face of tolerance. So we have to be cautious about not watering down the effects of sin and the consequences of sin. We talked a lot about that today. This important verse 35, remember my son and learn wisdom in thy youth, yea, learn in thy youth to keep the commands of God. Okay, I've talked about this before, but it's been a little while, so again, forgive the repetition if you've heard it before. When I was young, my dad and mom talked about the gospel all the time, and we did a lot of cross-country trips in our station wagon first. 
in a Buick sedan, actually, when we were little, and then we got station wagons, and my French mother had a sister in California, my Mexican dad had a brother in Provo, and I grew up in Indiana. So we would, almost every summer, because they were college professors and they got the summers off, would drive across the country to visit family, or they would go places to do research and take us, and so we went all over, and sometimes we went east as well. So we spent a lot of time in the car in the summers going to see great things and they always stopped by to see you know national parks or wonders and anyway it was it was great although yeah there was a lot of time in that car and we didn't have air conditioning for a while <laughs> so that was, that was a great invention those summers got pretty hot as we went through deserts sometimes and anyway great <sighs> great memories did a lot of reading in the car did a lot of talking in the car and my parents would talk about history, but a lot about the gospel, a lot about the plan of salvation, a lot about scripture stories. And my dad had this beautiful voice that with this perfect English, but this very attractive Spanish accent. And he could really, he was charismatic and great storyteller. So as he would talk about some of his favorite stories of the scriptures and he knew them all. So it was fun. It could be really entrancing and captivating. And I remember being particularly captivated by the story of King Solomon. And as you know, the story with the two babies that one of them gets suffocated in the night and both women claim it, and he is going to cut the thing in half. And the true mother says, no, you know, give the child to her. And my dad knew a lot of other stories, some of them maybe <laughs> from other histories or whatever about people, other great leaders of the world at that time, the Queen of Sheba and so on, who had come to visit Solomon's court because of his renowned wisdom and how people would watch him sit in judgment and they would be in awe at how he could discern how to judge his people and how to make difficult decisions concerning their troubles. And I loved that concept of wisdom. I loved it. I was so kind of in awe and rapture about how do you get to be so wise? And the way my dad would tell the story, and it's a little bit of a quick summary, but he would, I didn't start with this, but he would start with the fact that when Solomon came to be king after his father David, that the Lord came to Solomon and said, what do you desire of me? desire riches or wisdom? And Solomon said, give me wisdom to govern my people. And so God gave him both. <laughs> and I used to joke, you know, that like, well, I can't wait for the question because I know the answer already. <laughs> and Solomon was given both. He was given wisdom and riches. And then he blew it. So it's not a guarantee. We still have to be diligent and boringly consistent. At any rate, I wanted to be wise from the time I was very young. And I thought, wouldn't that be amazing? Like, how do you get to be that illuminated with wisdom? And then as a teenager, I don't think I'd read the Book of Mormon all the way through before that. But when I was a teenager and I read through the Book of Mormon and I came to this verse that Alma shares with his son, Helaman, this simple, simple formula. Learn wisdom in thy youth, learn in thy youth to keep the commandments of God. And I remember being kind of like jaw-droppingly astonished at the simplicity of it. Is that it? Is that it? To be wise, I just need to be obedient to the commandments of God. Now, that's a bigger task than it might sound, right? Because we do have a natural man and sometimes it rears up its head and it can be challenging to be boringly consistent. But I realized what an incredible blessing it was to read these words. If I would choose to be obedient, God would eventually grant me wisdom. And I am still hoping for that. I desire that. I'm grateful for things that I have learned and insights that God has given me, but I know it is all because of him. I know it all comes from God and that my part is to obey and then God can give me access to incredible light, truth, knowledge, and love. Learn in thy youth to keep the commandments of God. <laughs> it's really available to all of us. Again, God invites all and denies none. So, okay. <sighs> 
he does make a clear mention about don't be offended because of the strictness of the word. And again, I think this is something we're seeing a lot. People are very offended because the gospel of Jesus Christ does set standards of truth and behavior. And marriage is between a man and a woman. And yes, you should wear your garments. And yes, the Sabbath day counts. And yes, tithing needs to be, you know, all these things are a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ and people get offended. And that is unfortunate and self-sifting out. Don't do it. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. We can kneel now when it makes a difference because we could choose to stand. But why wait until it is no longer possible to stand? Why not kneel now before Christ and his gospel and follow him? So, okay, I just wanted to mention a couple of other things, and I know we're, we're getting long here, but current events, a couple of things. <laughs> This was just today, so I didn't give a lot of lead time to Doug on the editing this time, but the opening ceremonies for the 2024 Olympics were today in Paris, and somebody sent me some news from that. In fact, Caitlin was one who sent me some updates about that, and I looked up some things in any way. This is not the first time that these public spectacles that cost, you know, who knows how many millions of dollars and time to prep and all the CGI and whatever, all the special effects, but part of the opening ceremonies included a recreation of the painting, Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper with Christ at a long table and his apostles are, you know, kind of six on one side, six on the other. And while they didn't get the numbers right, it was a pretty clear representation or recreation of that famous painting that is still on the wall of a church in Milan in Italy. And the person in the center, in the place of the Savior, was a very large, plus-size woman, you know, with this sort of crown on her head. While the positions of the apostles were filled with drag queens. And there was a child included in that setting. And, you know, there has been some outrage, you know, like they would never mock Islam or, you know, Mohammed or whatever in a public setting like that. But they can take all the stabs they want to at Christianity and make a mockery of our Savior and that sacred time. It's really tragic that we're in a time where it's so brazen. Now, there's some good news coming here in a minute, but... <laughs> Anyway, it reminded me of an interview that maybe many of you saw too. Was that I just saw a clip of it. I didn't see the whole thing, but Jordan Peterson was a guest on the Joe Rogan podcast, and he has been an outspoken voice against transgenderism from the beginning and has taken a lot of hits because of it. But it's impressive to see that kind of courage in today's climate. And... He said to Joe Rogan, it's the worst thing, speaking of transgender treatment and, you know, affirming care medically, it's the worst thing I've seen professionals do, not only in my lifetime. I've studied atrocity for 40 years. I mean, he's a clinical psychologist, so you do look at the pathologies in order to try to understand how to help people. And this had become a kind of a focus for him, that he's looked at some of these things over his professional career for four decades, and this is the worst thing he's seen professionals do. And he's not just talking about the medical treatment, although that's certainly something he talks about, but he also is talking about just the psychological affirmation and saying to parents, he's mentioned this before, that to say that would you rather have a live daughter or a dead son or the reverse, he says there is no, no credible research that supports that horrible, horrible threat to parents that coerces many loving parents into doing things that they don't want otherwise to do because they are afraid that it will lead their child to suicide. But there's really no credible, replicable research that supports that threat at all. So he talks about how much of a betrayal that is too in some of the therapeutic community. And then he says... 
I've never seen anything worse than what's happening right now. And that includes the sort of things that were done in the camps in Germany, speaking of during the Holocaust when they did terrible medical experiments on some of the captives there. At least the blankety-blank Nazis admitted what they did was wrong and tried to hide it. And that is true, that they didn't want those things to be publicly known. But he says, now we trumpet it as a moral virtue. And then in a mocking tone, he said, we're freeing the children, while in reality, we're sacrificing the child to that parade of moral virtue. You have no idea how dark that is. And then continuing just a little bit more with Jordan Peterson's words, these surgical procedures are so brutal and so experimental that they're I'm going to say it again, they're worse than what the Mengele type, speaking of Joseph Mengele, who was an MD at one of the camps and did these horrific so-called experiments, but they really were just barbarism that, again, they tried to hide. They're worse than what the Mengele types did in the concentration camps in the 30s and 40s, and that's a pretty blankety-blank low bar. Maybe some of you heard, I mean, the world is, is it's just... So much stuff is happening so, so much every day and so quickly. It feels like we're kind of in a free fall, doesn't it? And so, I mean, the good news is Christ is coming. Christ is coming. I don't know when he will come, but I know that these prophesied fulfillments of evil reigning and the love of men waxing cold and all the deception and so on, that that, that is one of the signs of the time. So the, the trick is just not to be deceived, not to fall for it. Not because we hate people. We love people if we're trying to live a Christian life. We recognize their worth as a child of God and as our brothers and sisters. So it's not about hating people ever. It's about hating sin and mourning for the loss of innocence and damage that is done, sometimes unknowingly, because of the falsehood that's disseminated and the the ideologies that are not light and truth, but are basically designed to water down the principles of life and salvation. Just even things as basic as that God created man and woman. Anyway, maybe you heard that Elon Musk also was talking to Jordan Peterson. And again, I just saw a little snippet of that that has kind of become viral. And he says, I lost my son. Now, Elon Musk, I'm not saying his life has been <laughs> exemplary in every setting. I mean, I think he has a lot of children. I forget how many from a bunch of different women. So I'm not saying that he's always been on the side of the angels or wise or whatever, but he did make this statement. I'm grateful that he tried to preserve free speech in this country. <laughs> Anyway, I lost my son, essentially. This is a latest snippet that just came out a couple days ago. They call it dead naming for a reason, Musk stated. The reason it's called dead naming is because your son is dead. My son, Xavier, is dead, killed by the woke mind virus. And Elon Musk made a public vow to destroy the woke mind virus, which is interesting. And he has some resources, so it'll be interesting to see. But it is good that there are some voices that are coming out saying that this is not right, that this is a an ideology that has run amok. It's not healthy or okay. So what do I want to say about that? I want to say talk to your children. Like be age appropriate, but boy, they are hearing things young these days. So try to keep your finger on that pulse. And, you know, you can bring things up in a general way that's not too much information for very young children, but that can kind of every once in a while test the waters to see what they have heard and not be shy about teaching the truth. Things like men and women are different. And that's a wonderful divine design. And women are are wonderful the way they're created and men are wonderful the way they're created and we're meant to collaborate and work together and to value each other and ourselves help them appreciate their maleness or femaleness and don't get caught up the way our society has in focusing over much on secondary sex characteristics because to some ridiculous extent, it's kind of like, you know, a guy has to be really hairy and super muscular in order to be a real man. Or he has to love sports, or he has to want to go beat his chest in the forest, or, you know, whatever the other stereotype is. And it's like, 
and that he can't like dancing or music or the arts. Like that is ridiculous. And we have to teach our children not to get caught in that trap because it's out there. And it's really blatant. And I've talked to people over the years who have become very confused because they were not stereotypical in some of their secondary sex characteristics or their interests that have been now imposed as, well, that means you're gay or that means you're not a real guy or not a real girl. Again, we used to accept the concept of a tomboy without any problem, but now it must mean that a girl is a guy or is gay or whatever, if or lesbian, if, if she is not into girl things. I mean, those things are ridiculous, but we just need to help our children kind of think their way through those. I think God is very clear about defining manhood, and I think he does it in the proclamation to the world on family, where he says that men are to provide, I don't know if I get the order right, but preside, protect, and provide. Whatever order that is, those three Ps of the proclamation for men I think that's God's definition of a man. If you, as a man, are willing to provide, protect, preside, which I think can be interpreted to mean honor your priesthood, not be in charge of everything, but yes, have an appropriate charge for your family, for your, you know, the stewardship that God has given you, and take it seriously. Anyway, you're a man, and that doesn't mean you can't dance in the ballet or be artistic or sensitive or musical or whatever. I mean, it's so important for us to just kind of talk through these things with our children before they get corrupted by some of these, you know, definitions that the world is imposing. I've talked to a lot of people who have struggled with this because the world is telling them that they can't say these things to their children. Again, I know every situation is different, and I'm not blaming the parent if the child has a confusing developing time. There are so many things impacting that. There's this social contagion, you know, TikTok, social media. I mean, they're up against, and, and the educational system in some places, they're up against a tide that is difficult. So this is not about blaming parents. Please understand that. But as parents, we can do what we can to to help our children navigate some of these confusing waters by discussing it and having a conversation, being willing not to freak out when they come with their questions, not to overreact, but to try to understand their question fully and not lecture them, but share what we know, testify of what we know, be kind and respectful, and then check with them. Does that make sense? Or what's your thinking? And I hope you'll come to me again, you know, not to discourage that conversation. We want these things to be ongoing conversations. So when our kids hear something disturbing at school or in the locker room, or on the playground, or at work, or wherever they are, that they can come home and say like, oh, guess what, what I saw today, or what I, you know, I was confused by this, or I heard somebody talk about this, or it's trending, or whatever, and we can discuss it, so that there's, a, again, this ongoing conversation, and they can trust that they can come to us without getting in trouble, for having questions or concerns, and that we can not control how they think, but influence it. And of course, that means we've got to have a positive relationship, that there needs to be positive energy, there needs to be love and enjoyment and good recreational activities in our families, as well as prayer and reading the scriptures together in love, not lecture. Anyway, I did want to mention a couple of experiences that I've had. I've had uh, too many to recount with parents who were concerned. But one of them I remember was a couple who were talking to me about a son who seemed to be effeminate, didn't seem to comfortably fit into some guy things. And, you know, as we talked and bless the father for his introspection, and I was asking about the relationship between the child and parents and so on. He was the only boy in the family, so he kind of would fall into what his sisters were doing. He was very emotionally sensitive and expressive and so on. But it turned out that the father, you know, kind of had a problem with his son, and he didn't like him all that well and in some ways, because he wasn't like the father, and he was a little different. So the father said that, you know, I do get angry at him a lot, and I'm probably critical a lot of the time that I interact with him. And so he was willing to work on that because that's not a very great advertisement for manhood. If your dad is really painful. Now moms can screw up kids too, <laughs> don't we all? Again, this is not about the blame the parent thing. We don't always know what we're doing. It's certainly an on-the-job training stewardship. 
So it's not so black and white as to say, why, you know, why did you mess up your kid? Or I should have done this. I mean, of course, we all could go back and, you know, try to do it better a next time around. But that's not how it works. So we prayerfully and clumsily move forward. But where we have some of these situations, maybe we can think about it a little bit more clearly and feel some confidence and empowerment in trying to improve what we can and just get a little better as we go along. God loves improvement, right? He loves that effort for improvement. Another situation that I was remembering the other day was that one couple came to see me and said that their son, they had also daughters with one son, and the son wanted to always dress up in his sister's princess dresses and costumes. And they were concerned about that, but they didn't want to be overbearing or to shame the child or whatever. And I said, you know, does he have any play, like costume clothing himself that is more masculine, like sheriff's gear with a gun belt and you know, a badge and a vest and a hat and boots and you know, does he have armor, a shield and a sword and a helmet and stuff? Or does he have football player gear with those kinds of, you know, they sell all this stuff for little kids, right? And I said, what if you get a couple of swords and his dad plays with them like that? And it's just kind of like, well, you know, those are girls' costume clothes. These are boys' costume clothes. Let's get into those and we'll play too and encourage him to enjoy that. And they bought him some of those things and this young boy loved them. And he didn't want to wear his sister's princess dresses anymore, but he just hadn't had an alternative. So sometimes it, I mean, it really can be that simple that we just kind of get locked into thinking, well, these princess dresses are everywhere and they're easy to buy and it might take a little bit, you know, of investigation to find the guys, the more stereotypical male costume clothing. But anyway, don't, I'm not suggesting that it's always that simple, but sometimes it is. I have also told a lot of people that, you know, make sure, your son, because I think they're really coming after these young men. Women are under attack too. But make sure your son can hit a baseball and make a basket with a basketball. He's going to be in gym classes. He's going to have to be on the spot sometimes to participate in some of those activities. And maybe he's not a natural lover of basketball or baseball or sports, but but that doesn't mean he can't be sufficiently comfortable that it doesn't threaten his identity and he doesn't become an instant target. So like I said, he doesn't have to be a star athlete and please don't put that kind of pressure on your kids, but try to make them comfortable for what's coming in their lives that can help them avoid some of the traumatic experiences that sometimes we do hear about in counseling when people are confused about their gender or their sexuality because of, you know, having some kind of really adverse situation be a part of their developing years that marked them. So, okay. The good news, I mentioned it a little brighter moment. Maybe some of you have seen this. It's been, I think, in the top five in different genres of music. John Rich, a country singer, has released recently a song and music video called Revelation based on the book of Revelation. So it's easy to find on YouTube. You might want to you might want to look that up. He's not with one of the big record companies. He has his own production company, so he says that makes him kind of small fry in some ways, but it also gave him the freedom to do this without getting censored by his company, a bigger company that he might have been working with and He's surprised it has gotten such prominence in the charts, but he feels like that's, you know, a good sign that there are people out there who are still believers and are looking for the Lord's second coming. So the words are simple and repeat, but the videos, I mean, he felt really directed by this. In fact, he made this post that said, this is the most important song I've ever written. And he feels like it was given to him like in 60 minutes. I hope it brings strength to the saved, conviction to the lost, and fear to the wicked. <laughs> so anyway, I know my kids had to remind me that John Rich in his early career, you know, was in the bars and whatever, and his dad was a pastor. And apparently his dad was not too happy with some of his earlier work that was more raunchy and uh, not, you know, in keeping with his Christian roots. But 
he has wanted to be more of a force for good, apparently, here in more recent days. And he says that Satan has really pulled out the stops and it's more brazen and more public and seemingly, you know, widespread and almost accepted by the media. So he wanted to write this song. So it's kind of fun to watch it. At first, I thought, you know, one of the characters is like Satan, obviously, and the other character I thought was supposed to be Jesus Christ, but then he has wings. And in an interview, John Rich explains that that's the Archangel Michael. So anyway, when you see the white figure coming out of the bright light, that's the Archangel Michael in the music video that he put out. And he said, you know, you got to compete in some ways. And He's trying to testify in his way. Now, you may remember that President Gordon B. Hinckley said this in a worldwide leadership training meeting back in 2004. That's 20 years ago. You know, so things are certainly ripening since then, right? But he said, and many times this has been quoted, I do not know that things were worse in the times of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you can even remember back to 2004, things were much tamer by comparison than they are now. Boyd K. Packer, just a few weeks later, so that was January 10th, and President Packer was February 6th, so it's like two and a half weeks later, maybe three weeks later, in what was called an evening with President Packer, said, nothing happened in Sodom and Gomorrah which exceeds in wickedness and depravity that which surrounds us now. Again, 2004. So it's not a matter of us needing to become more wicked. I say this all the time, right? But it's a matter of us choosing glory. It's a matter of us choosing to become a Zion people. I don't think Christ has, you know, delayed his coming or I know there's a plan. So, but I don't think that the world isn't wicked enough. I think that ship sailed a long time ago. I think it's that the saints have not quite come to a point where we are ready to build Zion. And that I hope is our focus. I hope we think of it every day. I hope we we seek the spirit. I hope we seek sanctification. I hope that we are more earnest in our sacrifice of worldly things and worldly desires. I hope that we are willing to put it all on the altar so that when the time is right, there will be enough of us who are worthy for that call to establish Zion. Whether we go back to Jackson County or we build a satellite Zion wherever we are, as I get older, I don't know that I'd make the trek, but anyway, I you know hope that it would be a satellite Zion or whatever. Anyway, going on with Boyd K. Packer, because I think he said some good things. Words of profanity, vulgarity, and blasphemy are heard everywhere. Again, think of this. This was 2004. It's much worse. Now, unspeakable wickedness and perversion were once hidden in dark places. Now they are in the open, even accorded legal protection. At Sodom and Gomorrah, these things were localized and one nuke and it was gone from the earth. Now they are spread across the world and they are among us. Again, the world must be groaning under this burden. Immerse our children in the truths of the Book of Mormon. We should immerse our children in the truths of the Book of Mormon. That's what we're doing this year, but let's do it every year. That will lead them to the test and to the promise that is there, and they will be armed with the protective influence of the truth. You, the leaders and teachers in the priesthood and auxiliaries, are not the first line of defense. The family holds that line. Satan uses every intrigue to disrupt the family. The sacred relationship between man and woman, husband and wife, through which mortal bodies are conceived and life is passed to the next generation is being showered with filth. Surely you can see what the adversary is about. The first line of defense, the home, is crumbling. The very purpose for the restoration centers on the sealing authority, the temple ordinances, baptism for the dead, eternal marriage, eternal increase. It centers on the family. That's the purpose for the restoration, is to organize and celestialize families, to prepare families to be forever. This shield of faith is handmade. Okay, I'm skipping a little bit. He talks about the armor of God. And then he says, the shield of faith is handmade in a cottage industry. What is most worth doing ideally is done at home. It can be polished in the classroom, but it is fabricated and fitted in the home, handcrafted to each individual. The knowledge and a testimony of the restored gospel are like a vaccine. We can inoculate them. And I guess that's what I'm talking about when I say have these conversations. Inoculate in to be within and oculate means having an eye to see. We place an eye within them. 
the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost as we point them and help through precept and example lead them toward the path of sanctification. We need not fear. They need not fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. I have been in the councils of the church and seen many things. I have seen disappointment and shock and concern. Never once have I seen fear. Our youth can look forward with hope for a happy life. They shall marry and raise families in the church, and that will continue in the millennium, as we've talked about before, and teach their little ones what you have taught them. They, in turn, will teach their children and grandchildren. We will not fail. If we are choosing Christ, if we are choosing glory, we cannot fail. How long, and they quotes this wonderful verse from section 121, how long can rolling waters remain impure? What power shall stay the heavens? As well might man stretch forth his puny arm to stop the Missouri River in its decreed course or to turn it upstream as to hinder the Almighty from pouring down knowledge from heaven upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. We need not fear, brothers and sisters. Maybe all hell is breaking loose. I think that it is. But light always banishes darkness and Christ can cast out all the evil in our hearts and in our minds and in our homes and families. If we trust and are patient, patience and faith, we can do it, brothers and sisters. We can choose to live celestial life. We can live that law that will prepare us for celestial life. We can teach that to our children. We can help them harness the natural man to get into the terrestrial and if they choose, they can go all the way as we can. We can build Zion. We can be prepared. Thanks as ever to my husband, Chris Anderson, and Doug Marshall of Point Digital. Take care. <laughs>